nobody uh, tells people who are beginners, and I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that um, all of us who meticulously grind gemstones into D20s. You know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste. But it's like there's a gap that for the first couple of years that you're making little icosahedrons out of rocks. What you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. And your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that m most everybody I know who takes little rocks they find on the ground outside and turns them into dice. They went through a phase of years where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you got to know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is purchase a semi-professional faceting machine and put it in your home. Do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one shiny little guy. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And your the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. <laughs>
Sure. Or on a mat. Because, you know, it's solid topaz. Yeah. Man, so look, Parker, while he's working Parker here... Parker would be able to tell us so much about these lubricants going on right here. Why don't we have Parker on today to talk about <laughs> lubricants? People have asked why I slide the stone back and forth on the lap. That's obvious, and but you know that. the reason for this is pretty simple. You it's don't want the lap to get to gouged. It's just the entire lap yeah. so that it will wear out easily yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'll See? get more life out of it. I know abstractly also, how knives are sharpened. So look, while he's continuing to stand away here, hear me out. All okay. Right? You have expressed interest in making dice before. Uh -huh. I've heard you ask, I like, have. oh, how complicated would it be to get some molds and, like, For you like know, resin mix dice. some resin dice seems and stuff? Seems, like, maybe kind of approachable. Yeah, seems kind of approachable. You also... A.K.A. boring, lame. <laughs> <laughs> you also love rocks and minerals. It's true. You also are a good, capable computer programmer and artist. A very uh -huh. creative guy. I mean, mm -hmm. this guy, I've watched a bunch of his videos now. Not a bunch, maybe, you know, a handful of his videos. And he just makes D20 for the most part, because he doesn't know what else to uh -huh. make. He's a, a very nice, normal man. He's not an artist in the same way that you are. Wow, burn on... Uh, he's just, I mean, you're a, different kind, rock works. you're a different kind of artist than he is. This is a different kind of thing. You could make such beautiful things, and it's like a tidy little space. It's so much tidier and uh, more like space efficient than like uh, you've expressed interest in maybe doing like ceramics with a kiln and a wheel and stuff. Yeah, kiln and a wheel, huge mess. Huge, this guy does this in the mess. little tiny huge corner of his basement. Terror of fire. <laughs> exactly. No, there's no risk of fire. Making the dice with people. Look how beautiful it is. Make a few wow. Kind of an okay, it is looking pretty great now. Yeah. I'm really great. Plus you know all so about rocks. I do know a little bit about rocks. You would write the best to programs to tell you what angles to put the rocks at to make the kind of thing you wanted to make. Yeah. You want to see what so I'm gotta do some currently. math here. There's math here. involved. How uh is he gonna put numbers on it? He is gonna put numbers on okay, it. Okay, here we go. He's gonna use his plotter to cut little vinyl stickers oh, and then hit it with I've a sandblaster. A for reasons. Well, we have a new toy here's something else you can do with your plotter. The next video, wow, look at those tiny letters he has with tweezers. He reached out. Oh, is he gonna like the head for acid edge it? Plotter to cut the mask. No, sandblast it. What do you? Oh, okay, that makes more sense. What, what do you? Could cut I'm wrong, actually not. I don't fully understand why vinyl stops a sandblaster. You'd think the sandblaster would just take the vinyl right off, but it doesn't? Question mark. I'm sure you can figure all this stuff out once you find yeah, the right yeah, subreddits yeah. and Discord uh -huh. servers to talk to all the other faceters. That's apparently the, the, what sure, they call themselves. Okay. Then he's gonna put this like really uh, thick, gooey stuff on the like facets in between to keep them from getting sure, sure, blown away. How, how much does one of these bad boys cost in the end? Is I, that a couple you, of you, months. You can't so buy like, his dice, as far as I can tell. Okay, literally priceless. I'm sure he makes a lot more on the ad revenue from this video than he ever would from selling the dice directly. Wow. It looks great. I'm trying to get my hands Very beautiful, right? I'm really yeah. Excited to see what great roll shot. You know what they call this shot? This is A roll. Instead <laughs> 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 of B roll. I see what you did there. So, anyway, I think that's your new hobby. <sighs> okay. Couple questions. Yeah, it looks cool as hell. I'd love questions. to be able to make that. It is cool in a time where so much of the stuff that we have, it just feels. And when we talk about being old men yelling at clouds, it's like increasingly stuff is. What's the right way to to describe it? Like I believe in shitification is the phrase you're looking for. I was gonna for. try and be even less specific than that, and just sort of like say things have been optimized, made uniform in a way that makes them easy to produce and consume. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's a that that bums me out. So the idea that well, actually, we can also, and you've talked about this too, having this other aspect of that that we have this information technology that we haven't had in the past, so you can actually access this kind of thing, making really high quality priceless objects. Or I've thought about this all similar on talking about food because that's my other hobby. Like I can cook a meal that you would not be able to get outside of a like really high end expensive restaurant, and it's not necessarily difficult. A large part is just like the labor and care and coming up with right. reasonable ingredients and putting the time into cutting that perfect brunoise that you're never gonna get at mm -hmm. any restaurant unless you're paying hundreds of dollars. And it's mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that's cool that I can make this meal and share it with friends. This seems like I'm I'm terrified of investing in a hobby like this and then just not following through. See the the piano keyboard. And, this is a lot different uh, than a piano keyboard, I think. But yeah, look, I think an even bigger risk, a bigger <laughs> investment. <laughs> look, I, I I hear you. I think that is something that has kept me from trying new hobbies too. Yeah. It's like, well, what if I just buy all the stuff and then I don't actually do it? With Did we actually describe what happened in the video? He made a cool D twenty out of a piece of topaz, and it looks great. Yeah. Yeah, he's got this, you know, I think people could probably pick up on it as we were talking through, but he's got this, 
you know, it's a, it, again, it's fairly compact. The main thing is that grinding wheel with the water line. And I haven't looked into the prices of all this stuff. I'm sure it's, you know, a substantial yeah, chunk a of money. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's going to be prohibitive. I think you could, you know, sell off a chunk of magic cards and fund it pretty easily <laughs> if you, if you yeah, really wanted to. <laughs> um, if you had access to those tools, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, it doesn't, no, again, no disrespect to the great artist. I'm sure it takes a lot of practice. But with all of the, you know... With the fancy jig that you know has the digital protractor and like measures everything constantly, it feels like it feels like it's hard to mess up once you set it up right and, and know how to operate the machinery. I doubt that very much. I think it's probably very easy to mess up. I think it takes a lot of care to set that up and use those tools. I think I th- I'm so, my that's what I'm saying. I think the work is setting it up and like learning how to use the tools, which you could absolutely just do from you know watching YouTube videos and you know reading descriptions on the internet. I just think you'd make beautiful things, and it would be a, a beautiful physical hobby where you could use your hands and not touch a keyboard. You have to touch a keyboard a little bit to write the computer mm-hmm. programs, but you, that's the kind of computer programming you love to do. That's really that you're true. you're very excited do a little, to do. Do a little math. Yeah, and I've thought about, uh, I love doing thrown ceramics, you know, on a, on a wheel, but that's a pretty big investment. And in, in a lot of ways, I think that's a much bigger, I don't know how the money comes out. It maybe is a, a wash, but... It's not, honestly, that bad. I have priced it out, but it's... It's like you have to have a process to it yes. more than anything. It's, it's like now you have just clay in your house mm-hmm. and you need to like have a way to like recapture it. And exactly. Then like, you know, like the recapture like is a all big that part stuff of... is like it's, it's a thing that scales up well to a bigger operation. Right. Like if you had a bunch of people that were doing ceramics, then it, having a kiln and having some wheels and, you know, having all these processes in place would make a lot of sense. For just you, it does feel like overkill to like, you know, try and set that all up. But this is like a one person scale operation, this thing. Like it's just a little spinning wheel with different little plates of different grits. And yeah, maybe you get a stone saw and you get a plotter and uh, maybe a sandblaster. You could also do acid etching at the beginning if you wanted to avoid the sandblaster or something. Sleep on it. Think about it. I'm just saying. <laughs> just I'm just saying. Sleep on it. Let me know tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, I just think you would make such... I, I, I want to see the things you would make uh-huh. once you learned that tooling. I think it would be beautiful. Right, Way I'll, more than just I'll, D20s. I'll sleep on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about what are the non-magic applications. Like, what other... Or not, you know... I wasn't even thinking about magic at all. What, what other kinds of objects can you make that... I, I, I do really also just love cool dice. Yeah. I, I know. I, I might have a giant bowl of dice. You know, my, my aesthetic in my home is is not. I was saying this to somebody the other day. I was like, it's not that. It's not nerd stuff. And they were like, uh, excuse me, buddy. <laughs> mm, it is nerd stuff. Uh, but it's not necessarily. What's what's how do you describe the aesthetic? It's uh, you don't have like a big cardboard cutout of Riker. Correct. It's not that kind that's of a nerd good, stuff. That's that is you know <laughs> in the upstairs special room. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's yeah. I have a certain let's call it a mid century aesthetic, but I do have a giant bowl of dice that I love to when we have a game night roll out the big play mats and put the giant bowl of dice on the table. That's really fun. I think that they're just this interesting space that is somewhat functional they have a utility but there's also just a lot of aesthetic space to explore and have dice work in all kinds of ways you really like geometry i like geometry like you uh, like rocks geometry mm-hmm. writing computer programs i was just at magfest with geometry this weekend and managed to pick up a, a few new cool dice for the dice bowl i was gonna ask if you had some new dice editions oh, of course yeah, i always gotta scope out some new cool dice editions. what's your favorite new dice edition from magfest okay well i got uh, two different kinds i got some just big d6s with numerals Ooh, uh, numerals. And a D12 that has, it's actually a D6 in terms of its function. It's got dots, and it's also pretty large. Nothing crazy, but... So a D12 uh, with two six faces, two five correct, faces, two yeah, four faces. Yeah. But it what looks... The, what the point of that is? Just that it looks nice? It it's looks got, like just a D6 with the normal dot patterns, but then, like, d- weird... <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. Cool. All right, well, we'll think about we'll think about my new hobby. I'm just saying, you know... No pressure from me or our thousands of listeners. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, here's the other thing. Then if difficult... you did want to, like, you could also sell your first couple and fund this entire thing. You that's, know? A, that's a point. We've got a I little platform, like the, the custom real... handmade Anthony Stone die. The real difficulty here is, like, what's the entry point? Because can I just be like, oh, I'm getting, uh, not the whole, not spend $12,000 on the whole. I don't think it's going to be $12,000. Right, okay, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm looking right can I just get, now. like, some very good sandpaper and a flat surface and, and like, do some no. practice runs on some soapstone? I mean, that's like saying, instead of cooking, can I just get a microwave and some ramen and just, you know, try it out and see if I like cooking. Different thing. 
What? No, I would absolutely say go get one pot and a cheap knife and see if you like cooking before you invest in. Yeah, I'm saying don't go the for the stuff. sand blaster. Don't go get your and sous vide the... circulator and your uh, mandolin and food processor and blender all at once. All right, faceting machine, two hundred dollars. Oh, okay. So the whole machine he was working on, two hundred bucks. Don't even need to sell more than one magic <laughs> <Yeah>. card. <laughs> uh, now I'm sure that there are different scales of this but it seems like you know two three hundred bucks see one here that's much bigger than the one he was using it's like nine hundred dollars so i mean it's it's attainable you know it's it's within middle class no children uh, hobby territory sure, for yeah. you mm-hmm. i'm just thinking i think you should okay. look at it is all i'm saying or maybe just start dreaming of what you would make and then eventually those dreams will grow too big yeah. and you'll have to make space for them in your life I'm just gonna start buying like gem quality there you go. Non-precious start, stones. Start, start buying and, the rocks. And just have them like in a pile. I'm like every day I walk past this pile of crappy looking rocks, imagining what if they were beautiful. Yeah. eBay.com. Because you can make almost any. What do I search for? Purely rock, but good convex inside. shape with that machine, right? Obviously, you can't do undercuts. Yeah. With that process at all, but you could do like I think that's basically the process by which people like cut diamonds yeah, make for rings. Jeweling. Right? Like yeah. that's definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of precedence here. Anyway, try Googling faceting machine. And what else do you even need? Faceting machine, you probably need a stone saw. Yeah, I think also the... Well, I guess these all have integrated... The, they all, cl- they the, all cleanliness, have the, the cleanliness is important to me, personally. <laughs> so see, stone saws, the price is all over the place, but I think it's because the scale is all over the place. You don't need a giant one. You need a tiny one, because you're only going to cut little tiny rocks. Right, right. Anyway, I watched this video, and the whole time I was like, oh, my God. Every, everything oh my everything God. that kept happening, I was like, Anthony would be so good at this. He would be so good at this. <sighs> you say that. Yeah, I do. Knife sharpening is another, another one that uh That's another thing you I kind bought, of are interested I, well, in. Well, I bought some equipment, and then I never really used it because That's it's really, true. really hard. You do use it. Well, I used the fancy one. I didn't use the just, like, nice oh. stones. Oh, so you didn't use the half <laughs> attempt? You had to go to the good one like I just <laughs> said? It's gonna be a lot of bleeps in this episode okay. already. Well, we gotta stop swearing. But. Wouldn't this be a great intro for the uh, uh, creativity topic that we were just talking about? <laughs> rather than, do you want to do that instead? We can all we can call it audible. I haven't do even it, said what the topic just is. Just pivot. Yet. We could just do it, and then we could just switch it out later if we don't want to. Sure. Yeah. You want to just do it? Okay. Let's do it. All right. Well, let's do it live. Do you have anything else to say about your new faceting hobby <laughs> before we dive into the actual topic? Uh, no, I'm excited to facet some stones. If you have any recommendations, tips, pointers, where to start, I'm brand new at this. I've been doing it for approximately <laughs> eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you make such beautiful stuff. You'd be so good at picking out the rocks, too. You know all these things about rocks? I know exactly what every middle schooler knows about rocks. That is false. Who paid attention to everything they ever heard about rocks. If by pay attention you mean remembered literally every fact that was I within did. arm's reach of them in middle school. I did like rocks. Yeah. Since we've already talked a lot about creative processes and creative practice... Let's uh, let's talk about your battle box that you said was a huge failure. I think that's a great place to place to start is to say that I don't think it was a great failure. Uh, I think that a big part of the creative process is that not everything works out and you have to do a bunch of things in a rough way before you get to the point that you're making something beautiful. Both yeah, in terms I was of trolling. Yeah. You need to like obviously just get the practice, but also you don't know if a lot of things are going to work out. I mean, exactly like this video that we just watched, and hopefully you, the listener, paused and went and actually took a look at this. You're looking at that rough cut gemstone, and you see there's some cloudy stuff inside, but you don't really know if it's going to work or not until you actually go through enough of the steps to see, does that crack run all the way through it, or is that just a service defect that'll get sanded away? You just don't know, so you just got to try stuff out. Yeah, I'm trolling a little bit. I know you don't consider it a huge failure. I think you said that it was not super successful, was your exact words, in uh, how you described this experiment. I think that's pretty accurate. So what we're talking about is I recently, in the last couple months, uh, made a little battle box that was pretty experimental, and I really wasn't sure if it was going to work out. So I think it's worth talking a little bit about, about sort of the process and figuring out how to identify what the risks are in a creative project and figure out how to identify whether or not those are insurmountable or whether there's ways to address those as quickly as possible without spending a lot of time into it. And and maybe just talk a little bit more about our background as creative people and sort of where we kind of learned some of these skills and talk about this particular battle box in particular, which I still think is pretty cool in a lot of ways, even though I, there are problems that I don't have solutions for right now. I think we should start at the conceit of this battle box, if you can call it that, 
and work backwards from there. Cool. So the idea for this came from a couple of things we've talked about. We've talked before about the idea of doing weird cubes that try different stuff. And one of those specific ideas was a one life cube where everybody starts at one life. And I, I, I'm sure we weren't the first to come up with this, but we saw after we did an episode that mentioned such a thing, a lot of people designed cubes around that conceit and try and figure out how do we actually make magic still fun? Can magic still be fun if players start at one life? And there are lots of different strategies that people took, uh, either, you know, add in fair amount of life gain so that it actually creates a n- more normal dynamic of, of the game. Or Keldon, the Oinkinator, has another cube that uh, has a lot more rules on it ba- than this. But one of the big ways that he tried to create the game a gameplay that is still pretty dynamic is that no individual card will win you the game right out. So you can't just have a creature that has power. You have creatures that have no power, and then you have to put an equipment on it before you can actually deal lethal damage to your opponent and things like that. Yeah, Keldon's cube specifically, you have three life, not one life. And I don't think there's no other rules modifications. We were alluding to the fact that there were more changes. I think it's just that. You draft smaller decks and stuff, but that's... Yeah, and he has some specific draft methods and more, I think, just constraints on the way that he designed it and made card selections. Yeah. Another... I, I've played that cube, and I really like it. I think it's a really well-thought-out cube. So if you're interested in this space, that is the most well-considered version of any of these cubes I have ever personally played or experienced. So we'll put link it in the show notes, but check out the, uh, the Bolt cube by the Oinkinator. Another idea that we had had years ago, actually, we had talked about in our local Magic Discord, was the idea of a game similar to Magic, but everything happened entirely on the stack, where you could still have counter spells, burn spells, probably not creatures, but all kinds of things could still happen. But the idea would just be that there there is not multiple turns. It's just we are wizards, we are fighting against each other, and it is one moment in a game. And I think maybe this came out of just people talking about how much they enjoyed counter spell wars and things like that, and how much play was there in designing like an actually different game, a d- distinct game, uh, based around that kind of gameplay. Another thing that I found appealing about this was the idea of making it into a battle box. I really like the fact that I have a battle box, which is both players are playing from the same deck, and, you know, it's just a little thing that you can have, pull it out before if you have half an hour and you just want to throw a quick game before the draft starts, whatever. It's just a useful thing to have to fill up a little bit of extra space. And combining those ideas with the idea of a battle box so that it could be potentially even quicker games, you know, not 20-minute games, but four-minute games, so you could just play a couple things between rounds. And then the last component that kind of solidified this and made this something that I was really interested in pursuing was the flavor of it. So here was the idea. I wanted to say, here's a battle box. Your starting life total is three. Both players only have three life. And at the beginning of every upkeep, each player casts lightning bolt targeting the other player. Which is a slightly more rules-robust way to basically say, like, the game begins with lightning bolt on the stack. Right. Because oftentimes it doesn't last past that first stack interaction, but in the cases that it does, you want to be able to say, well, it's just going to keep, you're going to keep getting lightning bolted. Yeah, that's the expectation. And so the flavor was, this is magic players, oh, I should also say, players have omniscience, so you can cast all your spells for free. (laughs) Uh, And all the spells are instants. I was debating if I needed to throw in uh, some kind of, what's the, an, an... the Dalkin Ori sort of mechanic in there as well, um, but it turns out all the spells I wanted to include were instants already, so it didn't actually matter at all. So players are casting everything for free, your starting life total is three, and both players begin in bullet time with a lightning bolt point at the other. And I thought there was kind of this fun flavor to it. Wait, of- just to clarify... At the beginning of each upkeep, each player gets a lightning bolt pointed at the other player, or is it only your upkeep you get a lightning bolt? Uh, each player has a lightning point bolt pointed at the other, but it does matter which one goes on the stack first. Right, there is still uh, an active so that player, inactive player. The player who is going first, in uh, big quotes, it's actually is disadvantaged seconds. because the first lightning bolt is pointing at them, so they are the first one that must respond. They have to do something, or else that lightning bolt resolve. To be clear, the first lightning bolt that will come off the stack is pointed at them. Yes, correct. <laughs> because they're going to go on the stack simultaneously, which can't happen, so the active players goes on first, the active players goes on second. The way the stack works, the thing it went on second is going to come off first. And the flavor that I love here is kind of, honestly, sort of like old school magic, where the big part of it was you're a wizard, you're fighting another wizard in this battle, and I feel like we've kind of lost that a little bit in contemporary magic, where it's more about sure. you're a general and you're summer- summoning your army. It, it, I think it was so much more intimate in the early sort of expectation of the game worked, where it's like you're a wizard and you have this little artifact that you're using to try and destroy your opponent's brain over time by draining their life. Now it has this sort of bit of remove to the aesthetic of it, and a lot of that is like the literal uh, way that Commander works. You're 
even delegating to your general who's controlling the battlefield. I don't think you could blame this one on Commander. I think it was a... No, no, we can. <laughs> I think it was a very early... I mean, it's easy to take for granted, but I think it was an early evolution in the design of the game that they realized that actually the game is more interesting when it's all about creatures. Yeah. In, like, Alpha... You know, yeah, you, the best decks are just like channel fireball and, you know, a bunch of counter spells, weird combo decks. Like, you actually don't really care about creatures that much. The creatures aren't any good for a little while in Magic's history. So, that was a like, in the same way that there have been, you know, all these other chapters of the game where they realize that, you know, having spell effects stapled to creatures on the end of the battlefield abilities is really cool. And having these trinket artifacts we see now between like food and treasures and clues, all these other things where they take a common like cantropy effect and instead of just stapling it to a spell they staple it to a trinket artifact token these different like patterns that have emerged that wizards has found have play patterns that they want to encourage one of the first ones was we should make the creatures good because that actually makes the game more interesting yeah that's all true but i also do just really like that old school flavor as well that is i, I mean really i do think putting yourself in that role is oh more difficult i fully but... agree i'm just saying you can't blame this one on commander okay, you fine, can blame this fine. one on like what was the first set with good creatures uh weatherlight i don't know it was a slow change urza saga had some good creatures but they all said enter the battlefield on top of all these lands and they were basically not creatures at all it didn't matter it didn't matter if they were creatures it was just a way to combo off faster. yeah yeah so the flavor is you're a wizard and you're a you've wizard. just about reached your ultimate power you you have access to being able to cast all of your spells at instant speed you can do whatever you want with your magic except you're exhausted your life total is completely spent except for these last three and as soon as you are about to achieve the artifact whatever the goal is that's going to solve that last chink in your armor and also free your life total from this risk your nemesis appears, and you both shoot lightning bolts at each other. And the cube is titled, We Are Already Dead, and it's a fun quirk that you only win because you beat your opponent first, but there's still a lightning bolt pointed at you. They're, so they're it's, also it's just by the nature yeah. of the rules that the game ends once your opponent dies, but you're both already dead, and you both have a lightning bolt coming at your face. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know if this idea would work. There were some things that changed, obviously, just during the design process. Like, I realized that all the things that made sense to include, for the most part, were already instants or already had flashed because I wanted the whole game to happen on one single stack. So I could simplify the rules a little bit. I figured out some other details and just went through a lot of cards that I thought would be interesting. Obviously, having more lightning bolts gives you ways to end the game and, and win the game by destroying your opponent before you do. Counter spells make a lot of sense. Spells that gain you life make a lot of sense. And then card draw spells. Beyond that, there's a couple other one-off things I tried just to be see if there's ways to make other aspects of the game functional and be more interesting. But those are the core cards that, that I ended up going with. And thinking back to my college days and actually doing some game design in a more focused, serious way, the thing that was always impressed on me was doing prototypes as quickly and dirtily and early as possible so that you could actually prove some of these core concepts without spending a lot of time on the aesthetics, on the, you know, choices, all the details that are really important to making a game ultimately work, but those don't really work if the fundamental game doesn't make any sense. And even though Obviously, I'm not doing all of that with cube design. I'm just acquiring the cards. That's still a fair amount of work. And I knew that we were going to learn a lot very quickly because this was such a weird design that I didn't want to go through that. Uh, so what I did was I just printed off uh, all the cards that I wanted and actually uh, wrote a little program because I'm a nerd uh, to create very pared down versions of it that I could print on firmer cardstock and make little... They were like two, two by... They kind of look like the Alpha Playtest cards. Yeah, pretty much. To be honest. Which was fun to have, and it was literally something that I could be like, oh, I want to try some new cards, let me just go to my printer and print out more, uh, so that we could try things out immediately. And that was honestly a really great way to prototype things, and just let us, you know, literally say, oh, this card isn't working, let's take that out, tear it up, throw it in the trash, uh, or let's add some of these other things I was curious about trying that I wasn't sure about, and... I think that that kind of dirty prototype is really, really valuable when you're doing something that's this novel. Would you ever do that for like an entire cube that you intended to draft with multiple people? I guess what I'm getting at is there's a a big, I think, usability cost to colorless, you yes, know, not in traditional true. card frame, like just, you know, kind of like you're 
playing with largely known cards, and also mm-hmm. we're, from what I could see, playtesting with most of the people that were like pretty familiar with the game. Yeah, that, that's a great point. It's always just like a matter of evaluating multiple costs and, and needs and restrictions. I agree if we were playing with a bigger group and we had people that didn't, didn't necessarily know all these cards or, you know, playtesting a game that had hundreds of brand new cards, that's going to be difficult no matter what. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree. And if you do have all the cards actually already at hand, yeah, there's a lot less value to it. But I didn't want to go out and buy, you know, 12 healing salves that I would never use again if this didn't pan out. Yeah, because you broke Singleton on this and had lots of duplicates of lots of cards, right? Yeah. How many cards was it total, or at least is the current iteration uh, It was total? about 100 cards, and then we, we cut a fair amount. How many unique cards of those 100, though? I believe it's about 60 unique cards. Okay, I thought it was, I thought it was more, even more uh, Maybe actually even, even less than that. Does Cube Cobra let you see that? Uh, I don't know of a way to do that easily. So the result was kind of mixed. Uh, so we did the sturdy prototype. I wanted just to be able to try it before I invested too much more in it because I thought it could be cool. The idea of having something that has these like five minute games is pretty appealing and it could be pretty small in the end in terms of the physical space. But the result wasn't an obvious, this is great. And there's one really big challenge that we identified very quickly, which was just that it was never correct to actually let a spell resolve. So if your opponent put Lightning Bolt on the stack and you cast a counter spell and then you cast another Lightning Bolt and then they cast a draw spell, you don't want to let that draw spell resolve because it's just going to be either another counter spell or a, another Lightning Bolt. Or another draw spell. Or another draw spell. There's no lands in the deck because it's obviously everyone's got an Omniscience emblem. Exactly. Uh, so it was always correct, even if your opponent did something that seemed like it didn't really matter, was to put another spell on the stack. So it kind of just went back and forth where players would alternate their cards back and forth until somebody ran out of cards, and then you kind of resolve the stack, but at that point it was probably over depending on on how things panned out. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things about counter spells is deciding when to use them, right? Right. And if you have a context where because of the fact that there's no lands in the deck and every card either replaces itself or kills you or stops your opponent from dying, which in some ways are like, the kind of the same thing, just at a different angle, then, yeah, it's never correct to not counterspell something. Yeah, and so I did try to change this a little bit with some other effects. Obviously, you're starting at three life, which gives us a little bit of space to play in. So I included some shock type effects that deal two damage, uh, specifically play with fire that also gives you a scry, which is kind of interesting. Uh, because, and then- explicitly because that spell is kind of bad, right? You're, you're trying to like throw some fodder in there that people will let resolve. Because- right. Who cares if you put me to one and scry one doesn't replace itself, so that's a bad enough card I'm willing to let it resolve. Right, and I threw in some needle drops, which is a, an instant that deals one damage to a creature or player that was already dealt damage and draws you a card, which again, if you manage to deal one damage to your opponent and then they cast a needle drop, potentially there's some interesting space there where your opponent has the choice of countering that spell or trying to put another lightning bolt on the stack on top of it, or do they just let you resolve that and see what happens? But it turned out that that still didn't really make sense because if you let the needle drop resolve, it replacing itself, it replacing means itself it, just it means you just, you just never want to let that resolve. Is, yeah. Or it's just a completely dead card because you don't have another way to deal that first damage, so you can't cast it at all. So that was one of the first cards that we actually cut because it just didn't feel like it made any sense. A lot of it, you know, this played a little bit like Pi Gao, if you've ever played that, where you're trying to make little piles of cards that you're just seeing, okay, here's my 15 cards, I'm going to make a pile of three, you make a pile of three, and then we see who wins with these, like, tiny board states. This felt similar, it was just, here's my hand, here's your hand, let's see how this how this works out, and if you drew a needle drop, you just felt like you were down a card and were almost, almost certainly going to lose that hand. But if you resolve it, then it just replaces itself. But you had to be able to cast it, so a lot of hands just didn't have another way to also oh, deal that one damage. Yes, okay, yeah. Yeah, that is bad. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Which is weird. Or, you know, Zap is another example of a card that just deals one damage and draws a card, but again, e- even though it seems like there could be some play where there would be a meaningful decision of do you actually counter that or not, ultimately, once we played it enough, it really felt like there just wasn't. And I have never actually played this, but... If there wasn't any strategic complexity in whether you should cast your spells, was there at least some sense of importance of how you sequenced them? Or did that also feel kind of arbitrary in that it didn't ultimately matter what sequence you played them in because one person's going to have enough counter spells, one person's not going to have enough burn spells or whatever? 
I wouldn't say there was nothing there, but less than I hoped for. Less than I would, again, think like, oh, this is a project that's worth pursuing more. And a big part of that is that a lot of the spells were functionally equivalent. If you have a lightning bolt on the stack, if you cast a counter spell or put another lightning bolt on top of it, it doesn't really or matter. Or cast a healing salve. Those do the basically same the same thing, yeah. yeah. Um, potentially healing salve is slightly different because but both players could win the game. My idea was, if this panned out, was that I would also then put, uh, you know, 12 pillars of flame below the two lightning bolts, just to make sure that this game was going <laughs> to end at some point. But that's not super important. So yeah, I'm not really sure. That, that's kind of where I'm left with this project is, I think it's cool, but I don't really have a good solution to how do I actually give players agency? And I think that's really what this comes down to is that even though there's sort of the unknowns of having hidden information, of not knowing what's in your hand, there still didn't feel like a super meaningful space where players were making choices about do we actually let spells come off the stack. On the other hand, when people were playing this, everybody was smiling and having a great time. <laughs> and that's the thing that kind of makes me want to pursue this a little bit further, which is that it did, again, similar to Pi Gao, where a lot of hands felt undecided, like you had Flusterstorm, that card just seems unbeatable, but it was still fun to every once in a while is broken. draw that one hand. I saw it that, a couple times. <laughs> draw that hand that had Flusterstorm and say, ah, cool, this one I know, I'm pretty confident I can win. I just need to sequence reasonably correctly and that'll be fine. So I don't really know how to balance that, that it was definitely fun, even if it wasn't this really high agency space. And I think it doesn't need to go all the way, if that if that makes any sense. Like, it can still be somewhat low agency and have a lot of hands that end up going through pretty predictably for it to be fun because the, the sort of investment is so low because you're just drawing, uh, I think I said the starting hand size. We played around with it a little bit, but I think five was a reasonable place. You're just drawing f four cards and seeing what happens. I have some questions. I have not played this battle box before, like I said, and I don't know the list very well. Did you experiment at all with hand hate, thought seizes, etc.? You know, I didn't. I, I'm just trying to think of, I mean, I think it'd be the same, in a lot of ways, it just falls into the same problem. Thought, did, of, you, did you say thought seize in particular? Because that is a funny one, too. I think thought seize is really interesting yeah. because it actually costs you, you know, two thirds of your life, which I think is very relevant. I think it probably ultimately falls into the same space of like, why would I ever let you thought seize me if I have the option to not? And the answer I can only think of is maybe like, you have a shock or a zap. Well, yeah, if you keep Zap in there, it does make Shock kind of interesting. Anyway, I wonder how much that would change things, specifically the seeing your opponent's hand component, if you're mm -hmm. able to actually resolve a Thought Seize, which could be really not fun to all of a sudden know what's going on and be able to control that. Quick note, we don't acknowledge it explicitly here, but obviously Thought Seize and pretty much every other discard spell being a sorcery means that you'd have to adjust the rules of this battle box to give everybody a Vidalcan Orrery-esque effect because I don't see a world where the stack resolves and you are alive to then cast a normal sorcery. The other thing I think about is if there is this natural incentive to just always cast your spell if you can, right? Always put another lightning bolt on the stack, always put a healing staff on the stack, always put a counter spell on whatever you've put on the stack. Are there ways to punish big stacks? And I do come back to the Flusterstorm question, which I know you had like one maybe in there, like a one of Flusterstorm, yeah. and it's so a lot of to be kind of broken. There are a lot of duplicates of basic effects like lightning bolt, counter spell, fiery temper as well to try and do something with madness. Uh, but then there were a whole bunch of just one of uh, cards like Flusterstorm that were, you know, this might be interesting to have a more complex card every once in a while. And because of the play pattern you described of, well, it's pretty much always correct just to like go back and forth, dumping a whole hand on the stack. Flusterstorm was just this trump card that just, all right, well, now I counter right. all your stuff. You have omniscience, but you have no mana. You cannot pay for any of them. So it just says counter any number of spells on the stack that you want, which is broken in this context. But I wonder if things like that, and there are other spells that have a very similar effect, but it's interesting with the omniscience token or the omniscience emblem that a lot of cards become functionally identical. Like you just mentioned that Fire Temper is in this cube, and that's just way better than Lightning Bolt. It's just Lightning Bolt that has a huge right, upside because yes. you don't care about the cost being higher. Similarly, there's other cards that counter multiple spells on the stack, but they're all just going to be worse than Flusterstorm because Flusterstorm copies itself naturally for the number of times you need it, basically. I wonder if you had enough of things that punish big stacks, though, if there would be a disincentive to actually just continuing to stack things up and instead letting some things come off the stack because you don't want Flusters from blow you out, basically. If you had enough of those effects, that's one way you could potentially go. The other thing it's put me in mind of is 
Slay the Spire, which I have not played, but I have watched people play because I'm interested in it from a game design perspective. It's this card game that exists entirely virtually on a computer, and you play single player against randomly automated opponents, basically, that are also doing, like, you know, predictable actions with some variance to them. And one of the main mechanics in that game is basically filling your deck with useless cards. It's like a cost. You can basically just have crap cards in your deck, cards that do nothing. You draw them, and they're just like dead nothings. Gunk tokens. Exactly. A gunk tokens, the, mis- the mystery booster sort of... Gunk slug makes. Yeah, it mis- mystery booster iteration of this card, which I would not be surprised to find out is directly inspired by Slave Aspire, though I'm sure they would never tell us that was the case. I wonder if you could put cards in here that are just plain awful. Like, can you just put some Darksteel Relics in here? Just to like, what if the cube was a third Darksteel Relics? So every card draw was one third to miss on actually replacing itself. I don't know. And then can you maybe find some like far flung thing to do with those dark steel relics that is like super narrow so that you're still really punished for drawing them, but they're not like literally dead cards. That's the other thing I could think of. And that would make you actually question countering a draw spell because you're like, well, they might draw a dark steel relic, in which case I should just let that resolve instead of actually trying to fight over it. It doesn't have to be exactly dark steel relic. Obviously it could be other things that are useless or very, very, very narrowly useful that, make space for that to actually play that way. Yeah, I think that's sort of leading to a really interesting point, which is that this is kind of creating its own little game out of magic components, but it fundamentally plays totally differently. Yeah, it's not magic. We've taken out all of the things that make magic interesting about the resource system of, I am I have this balancing act between resources versus cards that do stuff, and I am rewarded for hitting that balance correctly, and also hitting that balance correctly depending on what my strategy is. Maybe I want a certain, like a larger number of resource cards, or I want cards Cards that advance my resources in other ways, think ramp spells in order to play bigger payoffs, or I want a strategy that is lighter on resources to try and be more proactive, uh, be more aggressive. And we've eliminated all of those kind of counterbalances that actually make that system work, and instead it's just this very linear, all of your cards kind of do the same thing, they either win or they don't, and there isn't that balancing and that tension of, am I developing a strategy in the same way? I think a couple other things that sort of crossed my mind were something, things like Delve and Escape that still sort of recreate a resource, which is your graveyard, which can accumulate. Yeah. And that didn't really work yet because, again, yeah, there just emblem, never so. was anything that hit the graveyard. So something like Cling to Dusk I thought would be interesting, both giving you the option to potentially gain life or just draw new cards and turn that graveyard into a resource. Didn't work because there was never a way to escape it. You just It didn't happen. And Escape makes a lot more sense than Delve specifically with the Omniscience emblem because... Sure, Obviously, it's a it's the a cost it's reduction a mechanic that is actually useless. has to be paid. Yeah. And that's a great point about Delve as well. But some other things like that, maybe trying to turn on delirium in ways like that. Maybe other ways to just cheat and not do things in the stack, or channel effects that are only counterable by certain effects. Uh, or are could be responded to with another lightning bolt, but can't be responded to well, with Well you wouldn't be able to channel things with specifically omniscience emblem. You would need to Okay, there are some that, there so are that, some rules challenges yeah. here. That is a fun wrinkle as well, where it's like, if we want Flusterstorm or similar mechanics to work, then we also need to structure it this way. Okay, okay, putting that on hold. Uh, if you do make things like Flusterstorm a tent pole of the environment, you could put rituals in too. That's true, yeah. Which would only exist to, like, you know, uh, Dark Ritual just says pay for three Flusterstorms, you know? Yeah, I actually don't hate that, and it doesn't make sense if there is a single Flusterstorm, but if there is, I'm sure there's a card called, like, Ristic Lightning. That's a card, that right? That is literally <laughs> a card, yes. And it says deal two damage to something unless they pay one mana or something like that. Something like that. So another thing that we could sort of think about is, if we don't have permanence, that takes out a lot of, or if we don't have a, a main phase that takes away most of what permanents do, but there is still stuff that permanents can do, uh, and the w- thing that particularly stood out to me was treasures uh so treasures could be another way in addition to being a ritual that lets you pay for uh, fluster storm also just interact with other cards so something i i was looking at was renounce this is one in a white for an instant that you can sacrifice any number of permanents and gain two life for each sacrifice permanent which then just sort of gives us this resource system back where if i have enough cards that make treasures those are either allowing me to pay for fluster storms or to generate life with renounce and as i currently had it configured there were just never enough permanents for that to make sense but we could also you know throw in a bunch of dawn flukes that you could uh renounce with their ability on the stack you can 
cast that with flash, but then you still sacrifice. Uh, there's some rules complexity here uh, that makes it a little bit hard to think through some of these, but that is kind of an interesting aspect of it. Another card that stands out is is Remand that does, isn't generating resources, but does just let you do a lot of things. I guess it's, it's letting you use the stack as a resource, letting you either bounce anything your opponent is doing or probably more likely just recover any spell from the stack. Maybe we just yeah. need a lot more Remands. Yeah, I think many Remands was actually going to be one of my next suggestions. For, for those of you that haven't played with Remand in this way, because it... I don't see people do it very often in regular magic, and that makes sense. It doesn't come off that often. But if you do have like a control mirror and you cast spell A and your opponent goes to counterspell it, you can either remand their counterspell if you wanted to, or you can next level them and remand your own spell they were countering. And now you get that spell back. And so you, you also get to cast draw it a card. Again later, and you also draw a card, which is especially great. I, I've only done this in my own cube like once or twice, and it's always been when I had creatures with like prowess or something in play, and I was just like, cast a spell, remand my own spell, cast a spell again, like, you know, a bauble or something. You just like cast a bauble, remand the bauble, cast the bauble, draw a card, draw another card, and like, you know, he'd go off with prowess stuff. I think remand, reprieve, which is identical here, doesn't matter which one you run. I wouldn't run both, obviously. Um, actually, maybe fun to run reprieve just so you have more white cards, because I imagine a lot of the cards are blue. <laughs> yeah, that's another funny thing, is there are a couple cards I was looking at that specifically care about white cards, because that's part of the th- white's color identity is gaining life, uh, and sometimes caring about particular colors of permanence, and it was it was difficult to find enough white cards that I otherwise wanted to play to make those make sense. Yeah, I think those are some of the most interesting cards in that like you said, it doesn't make sense to let your opponent resolve a spell, but choosing, do I want to remand that spell? Which, I mean, remand is also not that great against your opponent in this context because they can just cast it again. They have infinite mana. So right, right, right. I think it's a really interesting one, and I would love to see multiples of that kind of effect. Maybe even unsubstantiate, which is basically like remand, but, you know, don't draw a card, mm-hmm. but could maybe have some fringe applications if permanence do become something that matters. Do you have fork effects in here there is a fork a single fork a single fork no dual caster mage no misdirection none of that stuff misdirection a little bit different there actually. isn't but dual caster mage is a, a, another interesting one maybe i just need to look at every creature with flash is really what i should be doing Snapcaster mage dual caster mage seem like really cool cards in this context because again if we can solve the problem of actually getting cards in the graveyard well yeah i mean this will incentivize you to have something to actually go to the graveyard if you're in control of that but uh, dual cast mage doesn't that cares about the stack right right snap cast mage is the graveyard just things that offer you more decision making right where instead of every card being just an interchangeable kill your opponent don't die counter a spell you now have Snapcaster mage which can be any combination of those if you're able to actually get them in the graveyard uh, which maybe even means you like use a spell early in a non-ideal spot just because you expect your opponent will let it resolve you'll have access to it later on to make your Snapcaster mage good yeah i wonder if there are also things that are uncounterable that would actually be interesting or don't use the stack at all maybe things like mental note or cards that just mill your own graveyard it is funny thinking about this sort of space and how every card can kind of answer every card seems good from as a player perspective it's like yeah i want all of my cards to be able to answer my opponent's things but then you think about the entire design system and it's like well this actually doesn't lead to something fun because there isn't a lot of divergent interactions it's just kind of linear even though things look a little bit different sometimes i think with enough romans and fork effects and things like that you'll have an interesting thing come up pretty often or at least sometimes which is player A casts a spell they intend to copy, and if they want to guarantee they can copy it or remand it, they have to do so without passing priority, because if their opponent just says, great, that spell resolves, which they could do if it, you know, is a thought seize or a card draw spell, something that's not going to immediately end the game, they could just let it resolve, uh, in which case, then you as the active player don't get priority again after your opponent doesn't resolve, your spell just resolves, and you don't get to copy it or do anything with it. That's a kind of a rules detail that I think a lot of new players are not conscious of. I see this actually in commander games pretty often where someone says, I do this thing. Nobody responds. And they say, okay, great. Now I copy it. And it's like, well, actually, you can't do that, strictly speaking. I wonder if that could be an interesting detail of like, there's a value to me in doing a bunch of things without passing priority because I stand to gain something from it. And there's also inherent risk because I could get fluster stormed or similar. Yeah, I think that that didn't come up very often. Definitely occasionally players would cast more than one spell, but because there was always two lightning bolts, or almost always two lightning bolts in the stack, it meant that if you drew a fork or you drew a remand, there was always something to copy or pick up, which meant, 
I guess maybe we, that's another rules question is do we actually count the first lightning bolt that's on the stack as a card? I did have two uniquely marked uh, mm-hmm. lightning bolts to represent that initial game state because again, that stack order is confusing and so you want to be able to make sure you're representing it clearly. But it meant that you always had a thing you could pick up with those spells or copy with those spells. So it didn't matter as much when you did it, which maybe is an issue and we could solve that with changing the rules a little bit. I think very broadly, my observations about this exercise are that I think you came at this from the angle of like kind of flavor, like you said, mm-hmm. the flavor is interesting. The idea of like kind of hijacking Magic's rule system to make a like much more concise game and this running joke or like, you know, a thought experiment we had in our like local play group Discord years ago. We were just talking about a game that happens entirely on the stack. But none of those things, those are all kind of like to me, results, not like the input of the design impetus. I feel like what you need to start at is what kinds of decisions do you want players to make that matter? And one thing that hasn't come up here yet that could be interesting is making like bluffing a huge part of this. Like what if this was kind of like poker, right? Everyone knows the contents of the deck, right? Uh, You could like math it out and figure the exact chances of something in any given context but i wonder if you could design this in such a way that there was enough repeated effects that you could reward players for basically like suggesting they have something maybe they don't have and like the decision that players make is like to call their opponents bluff or not based on the information they have as opposed to just like dumping all these things on the stack i'm not sure how to do that per se but it does make me think a card like predict could be kind of cool here Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have other ways to like manipulate the top of your library like that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and w- there could also be cards that prevent preventing damage or prevent life gain that there is a very r- real difference uh, in the what goes above or below that card in the stack that you might intentionally say, well, I'm going to cast my two lightning bolts and then... I'm not thinking through the details of this, but do you know what I mean? Where it's like, yeah. if this spell resolves, it is saying something about what else you have in your hand that you don't necessarily have any more life gain spells in your hand, which could be interesting, could create some interesting space about what what capacity for block- bluffing you have after that spell goes in the stack. I also wonder if some more swingy hammers, like in the sense, we talked about Flusterstorm, how as a one of it was kind of toxic because it was just unbeatable. But yeah, I wonder if you put stuff like Angel's Grace in here that just says like, great, now everything that happened this turn doesn't matter, right? Effects like that that are kind of like hard resets that, again, just punish somebody for over committing to the stack, for like over committing things. And then you have this kind of cat and mouse game of like, do you have a way to hard punish me if I overcommit or are we just playing this like onesie twosie back and forth, you know, one for one game? And that's a thing you can bluff towards maybe like you can save your angel's grace or save your glorious end or your time stop or whatever that just kind of hard resets things and lets you go to the next turn where it matters what you did in the previous turn, how many things you actually overcommitted or kept back. Okay, when you say next turn, you actually mean the next turn of Magic the Gathering? Yeah. Okay, cool. Which you could get to if you ended the turn, angel's graced, like those things would allow you to actually do that. Right, right, right. Glorious end and time stop are both kind of interesting. I mean, obviously... Glorious End is much worse than Time Stop because mana is not a question here. But just saying, let's go to the next turn, uh, I think is actually kind of an interesting idea here. Yeah, another sort of challenge. That really is the most fundamental way to just punish people over committing to the stack. Just be like, all right, end the turn. We're done here. This stack is, throw it all out. Throw in the garbage. We're starting over. Yes. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. Another aspect to this is the challenge that Battle Box introduces because we're talking about basically the the mirror match of everybody's playing with all of the cards, you just get this random selection, which I think works for this logistical idea of this is a quick thing we can have for some like fun, goofy mini game. But it does mean you can't necessarily build really heavily around a particular strategy because you're not drafting a deck. You're not building a constructed deck. You're just working with this sort of mixed resource pile. So we could talk about ideas like maybe you just want to cast fling and you have a deck that really cares about trying to make a big creature at instant speed so you can fling it at your opponent, but that doesn't necessarily work. Like it's really hard to support those kinds of more narrow ways to end the game in this environment in a battle box. Yeah. I think having multiple angles makes it difficult. This does remind me of something. So 
I do have a Jeskai Control Mirror Match Battle Box that I built, which is much more similar to like a typical battle box. You get a big pile of lands, you can play from outside the game. You, I do still play, I don't like doing the single deck battle box thing because I don't like radically recontextualizing all of my card selection spells. So I just split this 100 cards in half. Each player gets 50 card deck. And you can actually do that with sleeves just by putting the two stacks next to each other and pressing down on them and seeing each other equal. You don't have to count them out, which is kind of fun. And in that battle box, it's interesting because such a critical part of the control mirror is who just continues to hit their land drops. And if you haven't thought about the control mirror in detail or haven't, you know, played it a bunch, that's actually one of the reasons you will like be the first one to try and like draw cards. If you're about to miss a land drop, you're like, well, I'm going to cast my divination now and like be the one to break the seal on this like staring contest. And in the battle box, there's no reason to ever do that, right? Cause you're both just going to keep getting your land drops for free from outside the game and so I did find in that battle box that it almost never felt correct to be the first one to blink, as it were. It was like, we're just going to both sit here drawing cards, maybe sculpting our hand with little one-for-ones that no one's going to bother countering. But to be the first one to actually make a play that's going to matter, like, you know, putting a big creature on the board or casting a big, you know, Sphinx's Revelation or something, it always felt wrong to be the first one to do that because you were kind of like leaving yourself vulnerable to somebody having the answer and then following up with their own thing. But... The key difference there is that in this battle box, it sounds like pretty much every card is essentially game ending, right? Because right. every yeah. card is lightning bolt or the thing that keeps you from dying from lightning bolt or a card that draws you another one of those two. And when everything is game ending, you don't get to make that assessment of like, when are you going to go for it or not? Which is maybe a different way of saying the thing we said to open this whole conversation. But trying to think of other cards that, again, fit in that space where it's not game ending. Like, I mentioned Thoughtseize, and that Thoughtseize on its face would probably be very similar to these other cards, but I think if you have enough of a density of these cards that don't matter as much, then the problem is, like, kind of snowballs in the other direction, right? Like, if you Thoughtseize me, and I'm like, well, my hand's not actually that good, so you can take one of my one-for-one card draw spells if you want, but I actually have no good counter spells in my hand, I have no lightning bolts in my hand, so, like, I'll let you Thoughtseize me, because my cards are bad, and then I'll turn these one-for-one card draw spells into more stuff and hopefully find better cards... Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, maybe like, the answer... Like, the deck's worse. <laughs> maybe the answer is just that if both players have a starting hand that is three-quarters game-ending things, it just is a matter of who has more of them. But if neither player actually has a game-winning thing, and both players have to draw some cards to dig for it, then that's going to fundamentally absolutely change the game. Right. And I think this is a, a good point to sort of readdress the sort of, like, quick prototype, is that I don't really have a good sense of that. Maybe it'll be very similar in the sense that it's just who starts out with more card draw and actually because that card draw will potentially draw more card draw, which might just be snowballing and we might end up in a very similar situation. But Can I recommend Orcish really, Bowmasters. Okay. So I was looking at Orcish Bowmasters over here. I'm looking at, I'm looking at Notion Thief seems kind of interesting in that that's a card that you really want to point your removal at. I was going to say uh Hull Breacher too. Not Hull Breacher. Hull, Hull Breaker Horror. No, not Hull. I mean, Hull Breaker Horror is broken because yeah, it doesn't have flash be, though, right? It does have flash. It does have flash. Yeah. What yeah. a guy. No, you can't have that. I'm thinking of Hull Breacher, right? The Merfolk everyone hates that is good in EDH it says when your opponent would draw their other card instead you make a treasure oh yeah yeah yeah. that that guy that's an option too that both gives you permanence gives you mana and also just stops them from drawing cards Urtai Resurrected that's kind of cool yeah Urtai Resurrected's cool if we can get enough creatures in here that we can get a fling I'll be happy what if we just get enough creatures in here that that's how the game ends well, you're going to lose. So the whole game is happening in the first upkeep. You're saying both people you keep counter, saying this. You counter keep, their lightning bolts you and then have to this, attack but, with but, a creature? But what, yeah, what if, you know, what if both people just gain life? They don't have it. Like, all these things are just a factor of the density of each of these effects you have in the queue. Yeah. If you tripled the number of healing salves and have the number of counter spells and took all the extra bolts, you would absolutely get to the combat phase in a lot of games. True. Now, I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying that none of these things are immutable. It's all a factor of the cards and the density in which you've included them. Okay, so here's a not super related question, but something that I was wondering about was, I like this joke of saying there's two lightning bolts and then there's a big stack of flame rifts, which just deal four damage to each player. So it just ends the game in a draw. Both players take a bunch of damage and lose. Do you think players will react differently to if you said, that's it, there's two lightning bolts. And if we get to the end of the stack, both players win versus saying both players lose? Oh, you mean you think they would collaboratively try to get to the end of the stack? Right. Which is like now, that's actually exactly kind of the crazy same. Interesting. It's exactly the same state of saying like both players win, both players lose. There's no real difference. 
but just does does framing it differently change what players would do if you framed it as like it becomes almost like a uh prisoner's dilemma style problem at that point where if you frame it as if you both agree to collaborate you can both win but as soon as one of you bluffs and, and saves that one extra bolt or that one extra counter spell to actually just win solo at the end that's going to feel better. You know, I mean, the prisoner's dilemma is, you know, if you both agree, then you get, you know, X reward. But if you uh, sacrifice and, you know, undercut your opponent, then you get half of X or whatever. Uh, like, it's this way to try and incentivize bad behavior and this interesting, like, game theory problem. I don't know how you, like, quantify winning, but I think the idea that if you could actually incentivize people to say you're going to play five matches and if you both win, you each get a point, And if you win solo, you get two points. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the first person or say do that and the first person to five points wins or something. OK, but, well, you know, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not collaborating on match five for sure. Yes. So, so you true. shouldn't collaborate on match four. Got to win. Which by means two. I shouldn't collaborate by match three. <laughs> well, I, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's worth thinking. OK, that's kind of interesting. And, and that idea of it actually being a, a positive thing that players could collaborate didn't cross my mind because currently with the density of effects, it would be trivial for both players just to say, uh, yep, yeah, we'll both counter our own lightning bolts and then both win. But you're right that if I say, okay, I will yeah. counter your lightning bolt, you counter mine, and I will let that resolve, and then I counter yours and then just say, oh, well, I'm going to counter my counter spell, and now you lose. Or now you go back to the now you now you're back to the mat now you're back to fighting over things if you've tried to like backstab somebody that way. Interesting. It's kind of interesting. Okay, I think. All right. I think you're so, gonna find it difficult to incentivize players to try and end the game in a draw and call it a win because we're so conditioned that that is yes. not the desired outcome. But that's an idea. Okay. So I was coming into this. We talked about this briefly before this episode that we audibled into this topic. I was feeling like, yeah, this this project probably doesn't really have legs, but we've kind of touched on a couple things that are interesting here. You're going to get a ton of great recommendations from listeners. Too. That's also true. The idea of just having a lot of other cards that generate resources, whether that's creatures that have incidental effects, maybe things like Snapcaster Mage, Dualcaster Mage could also then make things like Fling make more sense, could be interesting. The idea of having just cards, having a much lower density of impactful game-winning cards such that you kind of have to let incidental cards resolve. I see a lot of potential with that. The idea of other effects, maybe channel doesn't work exactly, but other types of effects that let you manipulate cards between zones without using the stack is potentially interesting. And then this idea of actually just doing a playtest and specifying if you both, you know, just try it. Just like yeah. say you both win the game, just try that and see if it actually makes sense. Bring a sense. marshmallow for each player and say everyone that doesn't <laughs> die by the end of this stack gets, gets this a marshmallow. marshmallow. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I'm saying like it doesn't matter if players win or lose. If both players are winning and losing at the same time, that is like in a mathy sense no difference, but it is an aesthetic choice. As soon it's as you I mean, as I like soon it. as you introduce either an external reward like a marshmallow yeah. or you put it in the context of you're playing five rounds, you get points for win or lose. Both of those things do change practically. Well, no, I guess uh, if you're winning, you want to collaborate. Well, think, even there, think, maybe that works. If I think you got to bring a whole backpack full of marshmallows. If, if you're That's winning, you want to collaborate. If you're behind, you don't want to collaborate because right. if you're both advancing towards yes. the same end state, you want to not. You want to avoid it moving towards that end state. It's when like you the, are it's like the doubling behind. cube in uh, backgammon. Sure, I trust you on that one. I don't think it's called a doubling cube. I think you just called double it. You know, you know how backgammon works? I, it's been explained to me. It's been a while. Backgammon, there's a certain number of points the game is worth, certain stakes for the game, and you can at any point choose to double, and if you propose a double to your opponent, they can either accept or concede. And so you can be like, I think I'm going to win. I'm going to double. And if they think, I don't think you're going to win at all, I'll accept your double, and then you get to like ramp up the stakes of the game, basically. Wait, does it? I don't get it. <laughs> if there are only you options, any if point, there are any options are concede or accept double, that just means anybody can double whenever they want. Because conceding should always be an option. In any you can't you can't tell me that I am locked into every backgammon game I play unless somebody offers a double. Okay, it is literally called a doubling cube. I'm not crazy. Great. No, it's exactly what I said. Each backgammon game starts with a value of one point, and the doubling cube is a dice that has sides that are one, two, four, eight, sixteen, etc. And when a player feels they have the advantage in the game, they can choose to offer a double before they take their turn, importantly. That's the moment you have to do it. So you're about to take your turn, like you're about to roll and see what numbers you're going to get. You can offer a double at that moment. And the opposing player can either concede or accept it and play the game at double stakes. 
for marshmallows. I th- I think it's kind of like I think the first of all I like this like try and mutually win because it plays with the we are already dead name. It's like yes. maybe you're not already dead. Maybe not. If you work together. I think you just got to play test it and see how the motivations work out. Because I'm not sure, like the marshmallow solves it, right? Like having an actual having an actual difference for both winning versus both losing is what you want. I don't know how to do that other than have a bag full of marshmallows, and I think it's a pretty good solution. I love it, except for there's a huge, huge flavor failure, which is that marshmallows are much better once they're toasted. A a. Okay, here's another idea. Take everything you learned from this, and then throw this in the garbage, and start with a new idea that I just had, which is that. You start the game with Lightning Storm on the stack, and your battle boxes contain plenty of land. This is the one that both players can discard cards to put charge counters in the spell? You could discard a land card to put two charge counters on it and choose a new target. I definitely looked at this card, and it didn't make any sense, but... All right, we gotta do another episode like our Trade Routes episode, but with Lightning Storm. That's what I'm saying. I just think it'd be cool to... Yeah, you have a good reason to put lands in there, and then you can do other things with lands. Do you have, like, Thrill of Possibilities in the current iteration of the cube what's the plural of thr- is it thrills of possibilities or thrills of possibility there or? are some thrilling possibilities in here that seems like an interesting card but it does hard punish you for getting it countered really punishes because you for you getting go countered. heavy in on it there's a couple of those effects that are basically but do the thing on but resolution but then the it's a sorcery temper. yeah i think the lightning storm direction could be very cool <laughs> I want to actually play test okay. this. I've never actually played tested this cube before, so I demand to be involved in the next session of playing. All right. It just it just it's been a while since I did this and a, a couple months even since we did these play tests and I just saw my little rubber banded stack of play test cards in my bag and thought about it. We should definitely pull this out and and make some of these tweaks. I don't know about Lightning Storm, but I'll leave this tab open, I guess. No, I wouldn't put Lightning Storm in the current iteration of it, but it's an interesting twist on the starting condition to say that I, I I very much imagine a bluff coming down to like, is your last card a land? Yeah. Like, or a way to find a land, you know? And the fact that you can't counter this ability, like discarding the land card, I mean, you could put stifles in there, I guess, if you wanted to, but discarding the land card while the thing is on the stack is like an uncounterable way to adjust what's going on. Whole different thing. Not that different, though. I mean, it's different. It's a different flavor of the same. A lot of the lessons you learn from this <laughs> would apply to the Lightning Storm cube. Yeah. I also like they did the roll to see who's active player, and if you win the roll, then you choose who the Lightning Storm is pointed at initially. Interesting. Is there a way to make... There's some reason why you would sometimes want a Lightning Bolt to be pointed at yourself. You've got Ward Pay 3 Life. Nope. No. Mm, uh, mm. Nope, can't think of one. You've got Enrage. I'm looking at the ley lines for no reason. No reason at all. No reason at all. Lightning Storm is such a cool card. I love it. All right. That's it for this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. By the time this episode comes out, I believe our surveys will be out for Murders at Karlov Manor and or Ravnica Clue Edition. Boy, they came up with a whole bunch of new clue cards today, and I realized that this set was not at all what I thought it was. Yeah, can you explain to me what this set is? I still don't really know. I I, I thought it was just going to be a bunch of clue cards, and they kind of like chose the setting of Ravnica because they wanted to set it somewhere, but I thought it was going to be like almost a clue secret layer of like, here's a small batch of clue cards. But it turns out it's a separate draftable set. I don't think it's, no, it's not draftable. It's a separate separate game you play with like additional rules on top of the rules of magic where you're trying to solve a murder and attacking gives you information towards that. But you can also ignore all of that. All the cards are actually just normal magic cards that work in isolation outside of this extra game, which is a brilliant piece of game design. So it's like that that Ixalan Explorers Something thing. Something like that. But all I care about as a cube designer is that most of the cards have no clue flavor at all. They're just Ravnica cards. There's just some Krasises and some Ilhargs and whatever. There's just like normal Ravnica stuff. And the design of these cards so far we've seen is awesome. I think a lot of these cards are like ringers for the regular cube. Ton of beautiful hybrid cards, a new style of hybrid split card, I am excited for hybrid split cards. No huge surprise there. Yeah, and this is a new style of them where a deck of one color can cast both sides, or if you're... The hybrids always share color A on both sides, and then there's color B and color C, which means that you can play in a monocolored deck of color A, or a deck that's AB, or a deck that's AC, or a deck that's BC, or a deck that's just C or B. Really flexible in terms of where they can see play. And the designs just seem really clean, which I think actually makes sense if they want this to be an accessible product for people that are newer to magic but are going to try and play this like variation of the game for clue 
making the game pieces simple makes a lot of sense, but oh, simple, clean game pieces? Sign me up. Anyway, great stuff. Some of some combination of surveys is probably out by the time you're listening to this, so uh, go fill them out. Check them out on our homepage, luckypaper.co. If you never want to miss when we put a new survey out, you can subscribe to our newsletter at luckypaper.co slash newsletter. I never send any spam, I promise. And I have to spend $10 to send you an email. So $10? It used to be $9, now it's $10. Subscribers are getting up there. We pay a penny per subscriber, plus, an, uh, plus a flat fee. Anyway, the point is, I don't want to spend $10 to send you nonsense. So I only send an email when it, re- it really counts. So check that out. All the music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. The show is produced by Anthony and I just completely changing topics after the introduction, me just closing my notes, and us just uh, winging it. Gotta go home and uh, make some dinner and research faceters. Faceting apparently. machines. Faceting, Faceting machines, machines and stone saws. I mean, having a stone saw it just sounds pretty cool. Yeah. And then you could also just cut rocks in half. How to choose the best fastening machine for your needs. That's what you want. My needs are making cool little stone art. 